Welcome back to Turning the Tide. This is Candice Salima coming at you from the heart of the Rocky Mountains, and I am so excited for our show today. Today, we are going to have three generations of American women, and we're going to go over a variety of subjects, and we're going to see how different it is from generation to generation, how things have changed, if they're coming around full circle, or what exactly is going on. So, of course, I'm going to be the one in the middle, because... I'm in the middle. I'm not going to tell you my age. <laughs> and then I have invited my mother, Muriel Slider, who is on with us right now. She was a columnist for a long time, social commentary. And I just have to say this apple didn't fall very far from that tree. That's what it boils down to. Mom, welcome to Turning the Tide. Thank you so much. It's a privilege. You know what? It is so fun for me, Mother, that uh, over the years, that the things that you taught me and that dad taught me have eventually coalesced into this career that I have as a radio talk show host talking about what is most important to America and how we can turn the tide back around toward morning in America. And so uh, tell me, as, as before we get into the crux of the questions, and hopefully Renee is going to get on very quickly here, we also are going to have Renee Cowley, who is a recent college graduate from Utah State University in Logan, Utah. She's very politically active, and hopefully I've sent her a text, and she will remember to come on. But in the meantime, my mother and I are going to go on and discuss some things. Mom, can you just share real briefly before before we get into the crux of the questions, how how you think America has changed since you were a child? Um, it has changed so much that... Uh... I think someone who had gone to sleep in my childhood and awakened now would think he'd been in a different country. He would not recognize this country at all. It is that bad and that extreme. It really is. And, you know, I was uh, I organized a tea party a couple of years ago on the 4th of July, and I had a World War II veteran who came and sang, and he was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And he spoke for a few minutes before he sang, and he said, and and he was choked up and tears were rolling down his face. He said, this is not the America that I fought for and my friend died for. Yes. 100% right. It is absolutely heartbreaking, but 100% right. It is, it is such a different country that, um, as I said, if someone would go to sleep back when I was a child and wake up now, he would wander back and forth to and fro in this entire country and find almost nothing familiar it would be that bad yeah i'm i'm afraid that's true and and it's it's gotten so bad that what was commonplace what were commonplace freedoms that you had as a child no longer and even accepted, exist by the way accepted yeah. freedoms yeah yeah accepted it they're, they're not only missing this this youngest generation didn't even know they were ever there. I'm sure that that's true, and I'm very sad about that, but I am sure that it's true. I am seeing them um, making making demands for things that one would one would never ever have made, never have accepted or even approved when I was young. Uh, as I'm watching what's going on in Wall Street right now. And, and beginning to take place throughout the country, apparently. As I am watching that, I, I stand there with my jaw dropped because they are demanding things that only would have been demanded by uh, people in the communist countries and people who absolutely did not see the negative in those communist countries, even though the common people suffered horrendously. And so what I'm seeing in uh, as a as a college crowd who've never really lived in the real world because mama and daddy supported them, mama and daddy provided everything for them, and now they are demanding that the entire country continue to give them what mama and daddy gave them. They aren't growing up. They're becoming 30, 40 year old, three year olds, and that's what's happening now. You know, I'm afraid that's true, and, and Alvin likes to watch reality shows and there is one he was watching the other day that just sickened me to the core, and it was adult human beings living as babies. They would go to work, then come home and climb into their diapers and their onesies and, and get their bottle and crawl into their crib and live as babies. 
Oh, my goodness. Yes, Mother. It was horrifying to see. And it is a recognized... So, so their parents took care of them? Uh, no. Parents? Uh, one one man had a live-in caretaker. Uh, oh another goodness. another woman just... I don't know how she swung it. I can't remember. <laughs> I was too horrified by the whole thing. But but it's what you're describing in that that they are refusing to grow up. And yes. and one of the things we're going to talk about today is the Occupy Wall Street crowd because you you were mentioning you were talking about them. I know you were talking about them. <laughs> oh, I was. I was. <laughs> you were. You were. But let's yes, I was. I was. Let's start with Barack Obama. Barack Obama said yesterday, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, well, there's just a little tiny bit of a delay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm okay. Barack Obama said yesterday, if I don't win in 2012, it will usher in a painful era of self-reliance in America. <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even say it without laughing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> say it on the radio to be recorded or on the tv to be recorded i'm stunned <laughs> i know well, you know, the thing is is his brain is truly wired to the cradle to grave mentality and any sort of self-reliance is a negative it is considered something to run away from and that says more than anything in my opinion that says more than anything that Barack Obama is so separated from what America is about and what drives Americans that he can never connect. He will never, ever, ever be able to lead America because he does not think American. What do you think? Well, I agree. I I am stunned. I don't think that, that he ever really grew up in America as we know it, I don't think he ever experienced it. I think he was uh, taught uh, anti-American ideology from the time he was young, and I do not think he has ever truly experienced America as you and I did. I think he lived in a different world and doesn't really have a clue. I, I think you're right. And Renee is now online, so I'm going to add her. We may... We may hear some boop, boop, boop stuff. So hang on just a second. I'm getting uh, Renee Cowley online. Renee, are you there? Oh, no, it's calling her. Anyway, and so, yeah, you're right. It is completely different. Renee Cowley, are you with us now? Yes. Hi. Hi. We have got Muriel Slider on the phone. She is, Mom, can I say your age? Yes, please do. I'm 73. She's 73. I'm 48, and Renee, you are a new college graduate, so we are going to address these topics today from three generations, and I am excited for the way it's all going to play out. Right now, we just started with the Barack Obama quote, if I don't win in 2012, it will usher in a painful era of self-reliance in America. I'm sorry, I can't even say it without laughing. <laughs> Can you tell me, um, uh, Mother, it, Muriel is my mom, and, and she and I just got done talking about what it was like, and self-reliance was the buzzword of her generation, not buzzword, it was the byword of her generation. Yes, it was. Yeah. You, and, you weren't a real man or a real woman if you did not rely on yourself. Yeah, and, and so in looking at it that way, Renee, I, I see it the exact same way she does. Can you tell me? how your generation, how you responded to that comment by Barack Obama. I personally was appalled by it, but you're right. I think it's something that my generation doesn't understand is self-reliance. I think that we're sort of brought up thinking that, you know, we're deserving of this, we're entitled to this, and that it's, it's a dangerous road that we're traveling down. And, um, you know, you can blame it on the media, you can blame it on, on current political tides, but I think a lot of it is just the... Uh, the current wearing and disintegration of our, you know, core American values. I I think you're right, Renee, and I sure wish your whole generation would, would uh, I hope they're listening. I really hope they're listening because you are right on the money. So in this area, in this area of self-reliance and, and what we believe America to be, what we believe um, to have driven Americans for centuries, and indeed what carved this nation out of this harsh and unforgiving land was self-reliance, the very thing that Barack Obama believes to be a negative, and so much of a negative that he's using it, he thinks he's using it, 
uh, he's trying to use it as <laughs> as I don't know what he's trying to do. I really don't. He he thinks that's going to help him in the election for some reason. I don't know why. Candace, can I can I say one thing here before we finish and go to the next topic? Um, Absolutely. Self reliance is a matter of honor, and in America, honor was always important. And um, a short time back, I I spoke to a young man, and I said, honor comes first. And he said, I don't really know what honor means. He's in that generation. He said, what does honor really mean? And so he actually does not know when I say self-reliance is a matter of honor. He well, then tell us what honor is. No. Tell honor us what is honor is. When I look in the mirror in the morning, I have to be able to look at myself and say, have I cheated anybody yesterday? Have I taken advantage? Have I used anyone? Have I done anything dishonorable? Have I harmed? Have I done anything that was negative rather than positive? And have I been dishonest in any way, lazy, useless, abusive? Have I done any of those things? If I have done any of those things, I do not have honor. Oh, very good. Renee, what does honor mean to you? You know, I think she hit the nail right on the head. Um, I think the point that I wanted to make is that it's a sense of, of pride, of pride in something you've accomplished, um, you know, the idea of self-reliance, pride in something that you've worked hard to do that has been manifested as a result of, of you, of your doing, of your work, of your intelligence, of your ability. Um, you know, you can see that in craftsmanship of just about anything that we buy today that there's not a lot of pride taken in, in people's work and, uh, you know, in their day-to-day -day jobs. People don't take pride in it. And I think the same thing, it's dwindling away at this this idea of self-reliance and honor. I, I think you're right. I I ab yes, absolutely. Well, I think we can safely say we all agree that Barack Obama doesn't get America or Americans because that statement in and of itself simply said that he does not think the way Americans think. And we've got it three generations. Him. What was that, Mother? It, ex it exposes him. It does. It really does expose him. And he should not be leading America. He should not be in the Oval Office. So, uh, Renee, this is where I'm very, very interested in what you have to say on this next subject, and that's to Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. The 99 Declaration, which is their declaration and they have a very fractured message but they have put this together and they want student loans forgiven they want government takeover of corporations and of the wealthy they want the wealth redistrib redistrib uh, redistribution of wealth yes redistributed thank you mother um, they want the American Jobs Act enacted even though it's a piece of garbage and they want a single-payer health care system and it went on and on and on and on. Can you tell me, as someone of that generation, when you look at what's going on in New York City and Chicago and L.A. and Seattle and Salt Lake, how do you view what these people are doing? You know, it's, it's scary. It's scary that people have that mentality to begin with. Uh, you know, something else that Barack Obama said in that speech was that, uh, you know, if he doesn't get reelected, America is on its own. Quite frankly, I would rather be on our own than have this type of government interference. What these Occupy Wall Street protesters or occupants uh, want to see is, is not only completely contrary to what our founding fathers had in, had in mind and had envisioned for, for our country and for their posterity, but I think that it, it laughs in the very face of, of self-reliance, as we've been talking about, of democracy, and of, like, of just... Uh, I don't know, personal de or common decency. The idea of redistribution of wealth is, is selfish and childish. I want to know exactly how they see that playing out. Would they like every CEO of every Fortune 500 company to write them a personal check at the end of every month? What have they done to earn that? Um, nothing. You know, if they are going to take issue with, um, you know, a hiring practice or, or poor working conditions and wages of, of these Fortune 500 companies, that's a separate issue. But just the entitlement idea of, uh, of the, well, they deserve it. These other people have it, they deserve it. And, and I think that ties a lot into what we saw in Utah as far as um, the, the housing market problem. And it's, of course, across America, but I think it's something that we saw a lot in Utah is my neighbor has this really nice house. I need a bigger house. My neighbor has a boat. I need to buy a boat. My neighbor has these snowmobiles. I need snowmobiles. 
And it's that keeping up with the Joneses in the way you see it and you want it. Yeah, and and to me, as I watch what they're doing, it is it puts me in mind of Woodstock. And I don't know if you know what Woodstock was, Renee. I, I and mean, you probably do. Everybody I've seen does. Movies. <laughs> You've seen movies. <laughs> well, I was just a child, but my mother was an adult uh, when Woodstock was carrying on. And to me, Mom, can you tell me if you see the correlation between what went on at Woodstock and what is going on at these Occupy Wall, Wall Street events? Yes, it, I absolutely do. Uh, there was tremendous drug use, and there is now. There was tremendous denial of basic human decency. Uh, the people used the, with the drugs, there was tremendous use of, of uh, uh, free sex. And, of course, when a girl got pregnant, why then you had to immediately kill that baby because because <laughs> that was yeah. the right thing to do. Uh, back then, it was the degrading, the personal degrading of individuals. That was 100% across the board. And when you saw them... When you actually saw them on the television, it made you get the creepies. You wanted to go and take a bath. And that's exactly what I'm seeing now. Uh, there are rapes. There are, I don't know if there have been any murders yet, but there are rapes. And there are people demanding, you give me what you have. You have, shouldn't have it if I don't have it. The fact that these people have spent 20, 30, 40 years working themselves to halfway to death to get it doesn't apply to anything. There is an entitlement mentality that has taken over and I assume has come out of the universities, uh, and it has taken over, and these people genuinely believe that if they protest loudly enough and long enough, they will get what everybody else worked for, and they won't have to work for it. This is communism, and it's communism without the jackboots yet. The people are not... the, the the people in the armies are not marching, marching in the streets, enforcing it yet. But if this happens, if this is allowed, it's only a matter of time because you have to enforce this. You have to force the people who have worked for it to give it to those who have not worked for it. And the only way you can do that is with armies in the street. You know, and that's true. And I was uh, up at, in a high school in Layton, Utah, yesterday, speaking to their Constitution Club, and one of the girls talked about in one of the earlier classes that she had been in, they had spent the entire hour talking about redistribution of wealth, and she said the class was split. The half of that class actually thought it was a good idea. Renee, um, I'm not sure they've ever taken eighth grade um, American history. I mean, they <laughs> they think <laughs> that oh, I live in America, I deserve to have these opportunities and I deserve to have happiness and wealth and, uh, and success, but they're missing the first half of the American dream. They're completely ignoring it. And that is you have to work hard for those things. These opportunities are laid before us. You know, um, I know that uh, unemployment is on the rise, but there are jobs out there and there are jobs to be had, you know, maybe not the same pay that they would want, but there are jobs to be had. And, and if not, create your own job. I mean, there is need in the marketplace. But they just don't understand that before you can have these um, riches and the success and that it first comes with we have the opportunity, you need to work hard for it. Yeah, you, you've got to sacrifice in, for those American dreams. Renee, you just graduated college. Can you tell me what the general thought was there that was being taught in the classes and how the students were responding to it? Was it that entitlement attitude that you and Muriel are both speaking about, or or um, did you see something different? Well, um, I think that my experience in college might have been a little different than most. I mean, I went to a, a very conservative college. I went to Utah State. It was in their communications program. Um, you know, so we had a lot of kind of farm kids that sort of understood the ideals of, of hard work and the importance of that. Um, however, you know, there were several of my classmates that I did see the attitude of, you know, um, Congress is robbing me. My my government is robbing me. Um, you know these uh, these wealthy one percent. Um, you know it's unfair and and it's unequal. Um, you know our system wasn't designed to be equal. We are not supposed to be the same as everyone else. That is communism, as your mother said. You know we are all given equal opportunity. What we do with that opportunity is up to us. 
And and I did see a little bit of that of that entitlement um, persona, but I don't think quite as much as I would have in, in other universities. What about coming from the professors? Were they, were they largely conservative, or or did you get some professors who were promoting that type of an attitude? Yeah, again, I think the majority of my professors were were pretty conservative. Um, you know, the, again, there were a couple that were mostly in the higher up administration, not so much in the classroom, but in the higher up administration, um, department heads things of that nature, they they were, um, you know, strong, strong liberals, um, especially in the communications department. Um, and again, we saw a little bit of that in our one-on-one -on -one interactions with them, but as far as being taught in the classroom, it, I really didn't see that as much, but, but I think that my experience might have been a little different than many. Well, then it sounds to me like people need to go to Utah State University. Yeah, right? they really do. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Because yep. even even at uh, other universities here in Utah, it, the liberal bias has has worked its way in. Exactly. So yeah, the you know Utah State even brags all the time that we have the um, highest rate in the nation of students who pay back student loans. So even uh, you know <laughs> the idea of those who who want student loans forgiven, which is absurd. That's again getting something for nothing. You you've taken the service, you've taken these goods. And you're now unwilling to pay for it. That's stealing. That's robbing, in my point of view, and uh, and that's not right. But yeah, Utah State has the the highest payback rate of any college or any university in the nation on paying back student loans. Good for you guys. Yeah, okay. oh, Aggies. <laughs> that, that is awesome, Mom. Do you have any last thoughts on the uh, um, people? I guess I'm going to call them of uh, the Occupy Wall the Street. Occupants. Yeah, the occupants. There you go. <laughs> Well, they, they have thrown away all human decency. They have thrown away what separates them from being a human being and an animal. I mean, the ones that are defecating in the streets and, and on the police cars and urinating in the streets and having sex in the streets and, and the one attorney running around without her shirt because it's her right and, and all these things going on. I don't even know what to call them, Renee, so I guess occupants is right. Okay, mother. All right. <laughs> I think that if this is tolerated, and I mean consistently tolerated throughout the country, and they are not literally washed off with fire hoses or whatever it takes, I think that it will spread just as it did in the 60s. And we are to this day suffering from the awful things that began to take root in the 60s. And this is nothing but the next step up. This is the next generation uh, down from that, and it will continue. It will be a matter of you owe it to me. The fact that I didn't work for it means nothing. You have it. I will take it. And if I can't take it physically, I will go to court, and they will make you give me what you worked for. This, and, and this, of course, is where the abortion thing came in because uh, another person's life meant nothing. If that, if that other person inconvenienced me, they deserved to die. It was okay to kill them. Now, this is what has taken place to the point where little children born who had tremendous physical problems, tremendous mental problems, they were simply allowed to die by removing all nourishment, all water and all nourishment. In cases, they were allowed to die. This type of thing is strictly a totalitarian mentality, and it will take over if we do not stop it. We have to remember that this is not something that might take over. If we permit it, if we do not fight it with everything, it will take over. This idea that you owe it to me, no matter what you owe me, that will take over. Okay, so what is the solution at this point? Th this uh, movement, the Occupy Wall Street, is not as nearly as big as the Tea Party movement. And, and when you do coordination, no arrests in Tea Party events, and over a 1,000 arrests in the Occupy Wall Street Tea Party events were all hardworking Americans who took time off their jobs to come and support the other American citizens in this, this call for the government to stop overreaching its Article 1, Section 8 responsibilities. And, and this is, I think, where I met Renee. It was at one of those Tea Parties. Is that right, or was it through the political arena, Renee? I, I don't know. I, I've run into you at a few of those places. I'm not sure uh, which yeah. one we officially met at, but we've, we've definitely – been yes. in the same circle in several of those events. Yes, we have. And so in comparing the two, the Tea Party movement grew to over 39 million strong last year, and I don't know where it is at now. The Occupy Wall Street 
has been driven by the unions, by the Democrat Party, by the White House, and they are seeing the direct result of the philosophy that they have of Keynesian economics, of, of um, cradle to grave, of communism or totalitarianism, as you said, and, and it is becoming a situation that is becoming so dangerous that they are now removing the protesters forcefully from the parks where they've been illegally camping and because it's becoming a health hazard. It's, it's becoming a hazard to the businesses around. And, and like Renee said, when they look to those businesses, and they or actually maybe you said it, Mom, they look to those businesses and they see these people, they see everything these people have, and, and as Renee said, they never take into the equation that these people worked day and night to get that small cafe, to get that bakery, to get that, that dress shop. And so we're, we're at the point where we have got to make some changes here in America or what is going on on the streets of New York is going to become a cancer across the nation. So first, Mom, you do you yeah. have a solution to what is going on? And then after you, Renee... Uh, I would like to know what solution you see, see should come from your generation. Okay, mom first. The only, the only thing that would work and will not be used, the only thing that would work is for the police, or I don't care, the Army, whatever, to go in and actually get rid of these people, take them off other people's property, arrest them, put them on some type of a chain gang, whatever it takes to keep them <laughs> controlled, and no longer violating everyone else's personal rights. The most ridiculous things going on, the only thing will work will be to forcibly remove them, and, and actually they should forcibly require many of them to clean up their filthy messes. Uh, if this is permitted, as it was during the Woodstock type of thing, it is a cancer, and it will grow, it will grow so rapidly that we're going to go through another one of these insane generations where the people self-destruct. The people who were self-destructing during the Woodstock generation, their brains are fried. They still act like crazy people. They, right now, uh, when you talk to people like that who went through that, they act like three-year-olds. Their brains are cooked. They simply are non-functional. They still think that what they wanted back then is good and, and admirable. And the only thing that makes them very, very angry is that when I work really hard and I go outside and I do all this hard labor, that I don't take it and give it to them. That's all. That's it. Yeah. That's and, you know, I remember growing up, uh, we had that quote on the mirror from Humanist Magazine that talked about how they had failed in the revolution in the 60s. And the only solution was to now go into the schools and the universities and to indoctrinate the children from kindergarten on up. And I think that's what's gone on. Uh, here in Utah, we've been rather blessed, um, even though, as Renee knows, we do have some more liberal universities, but, but we have got a lot of private schools and charter schools in existence now to combat what has gone on. And when you said, um, Mother, that, that uh, what was going on in Woodstock was this Occupy Wall Street is just an end result of that. It's, it's more than yes. we realize because they are the professors. Yes, they absolutely are. They went into the colleges. Recall that they said back then that their movement had not been successful in the populace at large. They said, yes. we have to go into the schools and the universities and raise up the next generation with this ideology. They that did it, they and said. they have succeeded. Largely, they have succeeded. But here's the thing, Mom. I have met Renee and other um, people of her generation that have given me so much hope, really so much hope that there are right thinking, uh, common sense driven people out there. Renee, tell me what you think the solution is to what is going on right now. Uh, you know, I, ideally, I would like to see an INS style roundup on a uh, on these people and drop them off at the unemployment office. But, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure that's a constitutionally sound argument. Um, <laughs> let them defecate. Let let them defecate on the on the, that particular step, right? Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe the unemployment officer's step. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I think it's um. It would work. I, 
<laughs> yeah. For me, this is a slippery slope. Um, you know, I, I strongly, strongly believe in the importance of uh, freedom of speech and the First Amendment. I think that, you know, were we to, to do anything um, to try and eradicate them um, from these protests, I think we'd see some major, major pushback. And I think that, you know, once you take that first step, you can kind of go down a slippery slope. What's to stop the Democrats then from, you know, being in these largely liberal states from using those same things to break up Tea Party rallies. So, well, you know, we're rally, very careful yeah. in how we do that. But I think that there are current laws in place. You know, they are violating, like we've talked about, the defecation yeah. of the streets, the indecency, those type of things. Um, absolutely. Throw them in jail. Get rid of them. But uh, um, it's not just these protesters. Like we've talked about, this is an overall indoctrination of entitlement and, um, you know, just the dwindling of, of American values that we're seeing across the board that are enabling this type of movement. So it's kind of got to start there at the same time, you know, addressing the current problem of let's get rid of the ones that, that are violating laws that, you know, don't have the right permits to be in these parks, that type of thing. Well, they don't, none of them have permits to camp in the parks. They have the permits mm -hmm. to protest there, but yeah. they are violating the law when they're camping in public parks. I mean, my goodness, they roused the homeless from so public you, parks. But they're letting incredible. these guys stay. <laughs> so do you think that um, that we're probably just not going after them because it's, you know, a politically volatile situation that if they do start arresting these people that, you know, uh, law enforcement will get a big backlash or it'll become a an issue in the media? Do you think that's why we're not going after them? I mean, if it's a well, obvious violation well, of the law, why aren't we arresting them? Well, they are getting arrested. And what's going on right now is the cities are giving notice the night before that if you're still here at 6 a.m., we are going to come in and arrest everyone still there. And the protesters haven't left, and the police have come in and arrested them for criminal trespass. Good. But there are still tents in, in Pioneer Park in Salt Lake, so why are they? Ha they haven't done it in Salt Lake. Oh, well, that's, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make is why are we not? What's I think point? it depends. I think it depends on the sheriff, and the sheriff of Salt Lake is pretty useless. Yeah. Like I said, I think maybe it could just be a, he yeah. sees it as being a – a touchy subject that he's going to kind of look the other way, you know, kind of well, like an immigration thing. Like, why don't we enforce immigration harder? Well, it's a touchy subject. It's well, here's the thing with him. He will not uh, enforce immigration either. He's yeah. liberal. He's liberal. And liberals are for this Occupy Wall Street thing. I'm going to tell you right now, if they had tried this in West Valley, that sheriff would have had them all rounded up and thrown in jail. Exactly. <laughs> and make them clean up the messes they left first. Well, I think... They're yeah, I, yeah some community service would be great. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I think that they should be arrested, tried and convicted, and not put in jail, but be forced to work eight hours a day on community service so designated by the court, picking up trash from the highways, picking up trash from the streets, rebuilding homes, rebuilding the park they've destroyed. I think that if we did something like that, we could start – to make a difference, but I believe the biggest difference that we can make here in America is right within the home. I think if I parents, agree. yes, if parents start teaching these values and principles that are critical to the salvation of any nation, and it starts there, and then, you know, like, Renee, what my mom did when we went to school, when we would come home from school, she would sit down with us at dinner, and we would go over everything we learned. And if we'd been taught something incorrect, she would say, okay, regurgitate what they told you, but here's what really happened. You know, we did something similar like that um, in my home at dinner. <clears throat> Even as a young kid, I remember, you know, kind of talking about not so much political ideology, but just sort of what's going on in the world and just saying, you know, do you know this is happening right now? And then kind of what do you think about it? And, um, you know, and then we'd say, oh, well, my teacher said this. And my mom would say, you know, well, are you aware that that's like completely the opposite of what our founding father said and, and that type of thing? I mean, so so we did something very similar to that um, in my home as well. Well, and look how we turned out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall wasting I don't recall wasting time saying, what do you think about it? I would tell them what I thought about it, and I would absolutely base it on history and fact. Yeah, I would my, base it very solidly, not just on ideas, but on solid historical facts and she consequences. Did. She right. did. It's true. <laughs> See, my mom was always a little bit more hands-off. She kind of 
wanted to know sort of our our personal beliefs of how we think things should be, you know, whether this is how government was set up or how we think it should be set up. And, uh, and even as a young kid, I remember my sister was always maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say compassionate, but she wanted to see everyone do well. She wanted to see, you know, everyone get this and everyone do that. And uh, and my sister voted for Barack Obama, so I think that oh, dear. <laughs> maybe we see a little bit of that now. <laughs> well, oh, the shame. <laughs> oh, the shame. Well, ladies, we need to take a quick break. It's a two-minute break, so you can stand up and, and walk around, stretch your legs, and we will be back, okay? Great, thank you.